For centuries, most of what we knew about the natural world came from what we could easily observe. But with the discovery of the hidden world of genetics, a lot of those assumptions fell apart. Some creatures turned out to be completely different than what we thought. Others broke the rules scientists had long held as established, and a few have revealed mysteries that we are yet to solve. In this video, we're taking a look at 10 of the most outstanding mysteries that have been revealed through the study of genetics. In 1734, English naturalist Eliezer Albin published his Natural History of Birds, and in it he included this drawing. Albin called it the turtle dove from Jamaica. However, it turns out that the bird he drew in England wasn't from Jamaica at all, but actually came from the island of Cuba. It has since come to be called the blue-headed quail dove. In 1758, the species was formally described as Columba cyanocephala. At the time, Columba was a catch-all genus for many of the world's pigeons and doves. But in 1838, French naturalist Charles-Lucien Bonaparte noticed that the blue-headed quail dove didn't quite fit in with other Columba species. So he created an entirely new genus just for it, Starnoenus. And there it sat in a genus of its own continuing its unassuming life in the forests of Cuba for nearly two centuries before anyone realized that this bird was actually hiding an incredible secret. In 2016, a paper was published in the Wilson Journal of Ornithology that made a shocking claim. Genetic analysis had been done on the birds for the first time, and it showed that the blue-headed quail dove wasn't closely related to any New World dove or pigeon but that its closest relatives were apparently on the other side of the world, on the islands of Australasia, specifically the terrestrial pigeons in the genus Geophaps. The researchers who published the paper called its position unexpected and biogeographically enigmatic. This left us with a big question. How did a bird whose relatives live thousands of kilometers away in the South Pacific end up marooned in the Caribbean? The bird doesn't migrate, it doesn't fly long distances, and there's no known fossil record of related species anywhere else in the Americas. Then a genetic study published in 2025 in the journal Biology Letters gave us a better understanding of the full picture. It shows that Starnoenus represents a deeply divergent lineage within the pigeon and dove family, one that branched off early and doesn't fall within any major modern group. The blue-headed quail dove has no close living relatives today, making it a biogeographic relict of the ancient past. The jungle centipede is hard to miss. Long, fast, aggressive, and venomous, with a range that seems almost impossible. They're found across Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands, Australia, and even parts of the Americas. Described in 1758, for over two centuries, their range left scientists confused. These centipedes don't migrate, they can't fly, and there's no evidence that they float across oceans on debris. So how they came to colonize islands and continents so far apart from each other was something of a mystery. This kicked off a deeper investigation, and when scientists turned to genetics, the picture started to come into focus. What had been assumed to be a single species all this time was actually a patchwork of look-alike species. Some populations were reclassified as distinct species, while others remain in a confusing species complex that's still being sorted out. To make matters worse, Many of the centipedes that were found in places thousands of kilometers apart turned out to be genetically identical. So researchers were left with the same question of how the species spread so far. But it turns out that the most likely answer to the question of their dispersal is us. These centipedes have probably been quietly hitchhiking with humans for centuries, tucked away in shipments of food, lumber, and soil. 
So the mystery of the jungle centipede wasn't just a case of mistaken identity, but a centuries-old mix-up that could only be untangled with the help of DNA. In September of 2025, researchers published a study of harvester ants in Spain that were discovered doing something strange. Inside the nests of Iberian harvester ants, Mesor Ibericus, the queens were laying eggs that hatched into something unexpected. While most of the offspring looked like other members of the same species, some of the workers looked like they came from an entirely different species. And when scientists sequenced the DNA of these unusual workers, their suspicions were confirmed. The workers did in fact belong to a completely different species of harvester ant, Mesor structor. And this wasn't some fluke in a single nest. Mesor ibericus queens were regularly producing two distinct lineages from their own bodies. The process is known as cross-species cloning, or xenoparity, and it's unlike anything ever seen before in ants or any other animal. In the abstract of the study, the authors write, In this life cycle, females must clone males of another species because they require their sperm to produce the worker caste. As a result, males from the same mother exhibit distinct genomes and morphologies, as they belong to species that diverged over 5 million years ago. The evolutionary history of this system appears as sexual parasitism that evolved into a natural case of cross-species cloning, resulting in the maintenance of a male-only lineage cloned through distinct species ova. We term females exhibiting this reproductive mode as xenoparis, meaning they give birth to other species as part of their life cycle. The Iberian harvester ant is the only known animal that uses this mode of reproduction. How this bizarre system evolved and why it continues to work is still a mystery. When naturalists first encountered the platypus, they thought it was a hoax. After all, it looked like someone had just stitched together pieces of various animals. Its morphological features made it unlike anything else, yet similar to everything else. It had a beak like a duck. It laid eggs like a bird or a reptile, but produced milk like a mammal. It had fur like an otter, but also a venomous spur like the fangs of a snake. Nothing else like it exists in the world. So is it a bird, a reptile, or a mammal? In 2021, scientists finally sequenced its genome, and it turns out that the answer to this question is, in a way, yes. The platypus has 10 sex chromosomes arranged in a chain that links together during reproduction. And strangely, some of those chromosomes have more in common with birds than with other mammals. It also carries genes normally found in reptiles, like the ones used for making egg yolk. And it's missing genes that most mammals rely on, like those for producing stomach acid. The platypus is actually a living window into the evolutionary past, representing a branch of mammals that split off early and that kept many of the ancestral traits that other mammals left behind. The platypus doesn't just look like it was stitched together, but in a sense, it actually is a genetic patchwork carried forward from an ancient past. When two animals look alike, it's easy to assume that they're related. And this is what happened with the Sengis. For a long time, taxonomists thought Sengis were just another kind of rodent, with their small bodies, long tails, rounded ears, and scurrying movements they looked like something between a shrew and a mouse. And thanks to their long, twitchy noses, they were commonly called elephant shrews. But that name turned out to be more fitting than anyone expected. In the early 2000s, scientists began sequencing their DNA, and they found that Sengis weren't rodents at all. They weren't even close. Genetically, they're more closely related to elephants, manatees, and aardvarks than to mice or shrews. Sengis belong to a clade of mammals called Afroinsectivora, a diverse branch of African mammals that includes some of the most surprising species in the animal kingdom. 
While most carry the names of well-known rodents like the golden moles, otter shrews, and the elephant shrews, none of them is actually a rodent. Their outward appearances are the result of convergent evolution. They look like rodents because they fill a similar role, but not because they actually share an ancestor. Today, many scientists prefer to refer to them as senkis rather than elephant shrews, as this better reflects their evolutionary history. Looks can be deceiving, and in the case of the senkis, it was genetics that revealed the truth. Horseshoe crabs have existed in a recognizable form for more than 450 million years, with modern animals looking almost identical to their ancient fossil relatives. For a long time, scientists assumed that they were crustaceans, closely related to crabs and lobsters, because of their hard shells and marine lifestyle. But when researchers began looking at their DNA, the story changed. Genetic studies revealed that horseshoe crabs aren't crustaceans at all. They belong to a subphylum called Chelicerata, which means they're more closely related to land-dwelling spiders, scorpions, and ticks than they are to crabs or lobsters. Although they may resemble crustaceans at first glance, their anatomy tells a different story. Horseshoe crabs have jointed legs, fang-like feeding structures, and no antennae, traits that align them more with arachnids than with anything else in the ocean, and their DNA confirms this unexpected connection. Deloid rotifers are microscopic animals that live in fresh water and moist environments. And while one might assume that something this small isn't capable of anything very complicated, their biology is so strange that scientists spent years trying to explain how they even exist. No one has ever seen a male deloid rotifer. As far as anyone can tell, these tiny animals have reproduced asexually for millions of years. While that alone is unusual, it's not unheard of. But what's truly bizarre is how they've managed to avoid the usual downsides of asexual reproduction, such as harmful mutations gradually building up in their genome. When researchers were finally able to examine their DNA, they realized that deloid rotifers had found a workaround. They steal genetic material from other organisms. When a rotifer dries out, its cells break open and when it rehydrates, it can pull in bits of environmental DNA and patch them into its own genome. Genetic sequencing has shown that up to 10% of their genome comes from completely unrelated species, including fungi, bacteria, and plants. And these foreign genes aren't just sitting there. They're actively used, allowing the rotifers to survive in harsh environments. It's a crude but effective form of horizontal gene transfer that gives them new traits without the need for sexual reproduction. In the streams and rivers of the U.S. state of North Carolina lives a strange species of salamander with what might be one of the most impressive genomes on Earth. The Noose River water dog is entirely aquatic and has a rather primitive, almost ancestral appearance. Similar to the more famous axolotl, this species retains features typical of larval amphibians throughout its life. This includes its external feathery gills, which most salamanders lose as they change into adults. It also has a flat, broad head, small, lidless eyes, and a laterally compressed tail designed for swimming. Traits commonly seen in amphibian larvae or ancestral aquatic forms. While the species seems primitive or simplistic, on a genetic level, it holds a remarkable distinction. The Noose River water dog has the longest genome of any four-limbed animal on Earth. It's roughly 120 billion base pairs long, making it about 40 times larger than the human genome. But this doesn't mean that the water dog has more genes. In fact, it has roughly the same number as most other vertebrates. What makes its genome so massive is the amount of repetitive, non-coding DNA. 
Large sections are filled with sequences that don't directly code for proteins, but have been duplicated and accumulated over millions of years. Salamanders in general are known for having bloated genomes, but the Noose River water dog is in a category of its own. The reason for this expansion isn't fully understood, but it's part of what makes salamanders such a curiosity in genetics. Studies of animals like the water dog are helping scientists explore why some genomes expand so dramatically and how organisms can adapt to carry such vast genetic baggage. Off the coast of Western Australia, in the shadow sunlit waters of Shark Bay, stretches a vast underwater meadow. To the casual observer, it just looks like a seagrass bed, dense, green, and swaying gently with the current. This seagrass species, known as Posidonia australis, has been studied by scientists for years, and they assumed it was made up of many individual plants growing side by side, as most seagrass meadows are. But when researchers began collecting genetic samples, they found that no matter where they sampled, whether a few meters apart or tens of kilometers away, the genetic sequence was exactly the same. The seagrass wasn't just the same species, but all part of one single plant. It had spread across more than 200 square kilometers of seabed. The species uses clonal growth to spread, slowly expanding from a single plant by sending out runners over thousands of years. Every blade of grass is part of the same root system, and it's all genetically identical, making it the largest known organism ever recorded on Earth. In the waters of the southeastern United States and northeastern Mexico lives the sailfin molly, its range overlaps slightly with the more southerly shortfin molly. Interestingly, where the two species overlap, a hybrid molly has appeared that is now recognized as its own species, the Amazon molly. This small, unassuming fish may not catch anyone's eye, but what they lack in visual interest, they make up for by having one of the strangest forms of reproduction in the world. The Amazon molly is a species made up entirely of females. With no males for reproduction, the fish uses a form of asexual reproduction to produce offspring. But scientists noticed that before laying eggs, the females would mate with males of other closely related species. But genetic testing showed that every one of the offspring was an identical match to their mothers. So why did mating need to occur? It turns out that when they mate, the male sperm triggers the development of the egg, but it doesn't actually contribute any genetic material to the offspring at all. This process is called gynogenesis, and it's extremely rare among vertebrates. But in the Amazon molly, it's been shown to have been going on for thousands of generations. It's a curious system, and one that raises a lot of questions. With little to no genetic variation between individuals, the species should be more vulnerable to disease and environmental change. And yet, the Amazon molly continues to survive, thrive, and reproduce, using other species to sustain its strange lineage. And that's it for this week's video. Which of these species did you find the most interesting? Let me know in the comments below. I need to say a special thanks to my patrons. Without their ongoing support, I wouldn't be able to make a video like this every week. If you want to support the channel, consider joining us on Patreon. The link is in the video description below. Or consider becoming a member here on YouTube by hitting the join button below the video. Members get access to exclusive perks like early video releases, special badges, and custom emojis to use in comments. Your support helps me keep making the best content that I can. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.